think you're a good person? I guess. Are you going to be innocent or guilty on Judgment Day? I don't know. Well, Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. Hey guys, I hope everybody's doing good. On this episode of the Catholic OCD podcast, I want to discuss something that is very dear to my heart, a topic of theology that is something that I am absolutely obsessed with, and it's the theology of being born again, a.k.a. regeneration. There are many Christians who do not believe that Catholicism teaches that we must be born again to go to heaven. What's really sad is not only are there Protestants who don't believe that Catholicism teaches that we have to be born again, but there are some Catholics who don't understand the Catholic doctrine of regeneration. I want to prove today that not only does Catholicism teach that we must be born again to go to heaven, but in a certain way, the Catholic Church actually defends the in-depth beauty of this doctrine and its full understanding of what actually happens to a human person when they are born again. Before we get started, if you guys could do me a favor and like and subscribe to this podcast and ring the bell. I have not monetized this podcast, but I do want to spread the word and spread the gospel message that is in its fullness through the Catholic Church to other people. So by you liking and subscribing, it helps to promote this gospel message. I noticed that 88% of people who watch this have not yet subscribed to this channel. So do me a favor, help me help others by teaching the truth and the beauty of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church. So, before we get started, I kind of want to point out, many of you guys might have noticed who have been watching this channel as of the last couple months, that I got you know, my hair cut and my beard trimmed a little bit. That's because my wife was kind enough to point out to me that I was looking like a bum. Even though I was trying to go through this whole uh, theological, religious, John the Baptist kind of look, my wife pointed out to me that while I thought I was looking like this... Change your hearts! Take the right way! The Lord saith, my ways are not your ways! My wife let me know that I actually kind of really was starting to look like this. Okay, all kidding aside, let's start off by going through the three points that people like Ray Comfort and others try to prove in their teaching of the necessity of being born again. And I want to show that they are right in these three steps. The issue is, I believe that there are two components of being born again that people like Ray Comfort and other Protestants who preach like him, I think that there are two steps or two components that they miss in what regeneration actually does. And so while we can agree and appreciate the three aspects that they teach, we need to understand as Catholics and as Bible readers that there are actually five components of the doctrine of regeneration. Let's begin by looking at the first of the three steps that people do, like Ray Comfort, in evangelizing people and showing them that we have to be born again. The first step is they're always going to show how we are sinful and how we are utterly dependent on Jesus because we have broken the law and we cannot produce our own righteousness. You think you're a good person? I guess. You ever looked at a woman with lust? <laughs> I mean, you can say that, yeah. Do you think you're a good person? No. Broken the Ten Commandments? Yes. Are you a good person? I believe I'm a good person, yes. Have you ever told any lies? Yes. So what we can see here is what many people do, which is a necessary step in proving that we have to be born again, is to prove that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when you look, Ray Comfort always brings about the actual sins that somebody commits 
and proves that, listen, we have broken the law. Therefore, if we were to go in front of God as a judge and he were to view us guilty or innocent based on our keeping the law perfectly, who among us would be found innocent? We would all be found guilty. And listen, this is true. We all are sinners. We all needed saved by a Savior. The second step is proving that we need to have faith in Jesus Christ and we need to have faith that he died for us and that he took on the penalty of death that was due to us because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. We broke God's law and Jesus paid the fine. God can commute your death sentence and let you live because Jesus paid your fine and rose again on the third day. Jesus suffered and died on the cross for the sin of the world. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. Jesus died for us so that we can be forgiven. This is a true step and us Catholics understand this and we believe this completely. So the third step then is this idea of well, now you are born again. And if you're born again, then that means now you are not guilty. In John chapter 3 in the Bible, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to enter heaven. He said this, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. In John chapter 3, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Right. Familiar with John chapter 3, where Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Boy, so you've got to be born again. This is your salvation. So let's make sure you're born again. Now, this is true in this third step of when we are born again. It is understood that the meritorious works of Christ are attributed and credited to us so that we can enter into a state of being not guilty. We went from a state of being guilty to a state of being not guilty. This is able to be done because Jesus died on the cross as our sin offering. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is very true. These three steps are fantastic steps. And listen, I'm happy that Ray Comfort teaches people these three steps. One, you have to realize that you have a problem, that we have sin, that we are sinful and we have sinned against God and therefore we would be found guilty. Step number two that he teaches, you have to have faith that Jesus died for you. And that step number three is this understanding that those who are born again, they are freed from the eternal guilt that is due to them because of their sins. So there's nothing I can say against these three steps. There's just two other steps, two other aspects of being born again that the gospel that Ray Comfort is pushing misses, but yet are very biblical. Before we get to those two steps, what I want to do, though, is I want to prove to you that what Ray Comfort teaches in those three steps is 100% held by the Catholic Church. Where are we going to go at to see that the Catholic Church believes this? We're going to go straight to the Council of Trent, the supposed council that anathemized the gospel. So I'm not reading just from the canons or the anathemas of Trent today. I'm actually reading from the section on justification and the different chapters about justification through the Council of Trent. I want to start off by reading chapter 1 of the Council of Trent. And this is on the inability of nature and of the law to justify man. The Holy Synod declares that for the correct and sound understanding of the doctrine of justification, it is necessary that each one recognize and confess that whereas all men had lost their innocence 
in the prevarication of Adam having become unclean, and as the apostle says, by nature children of wrath, as this synod or council has set forth in the decree of original sin, they were so far the servants of sin and under the power of the devil and of death, that not the Gentiles only by the force of nature, but not even the Jews by the very letter itself of the law of Moses were able to be liberated or to arise therefrom, although free will attenuated as it was in its powers and bent down was by no means extinguished in them. So what this is saying here is that Trent is saying that, listen, all people are born sinful. Because of Adam's prevarication, which basically means Adam swayed from the truth. He left the truth and he left the light. And because of that, we inherit this. So therefore, man is utterly dependent on God. And what Trent's saying is, it's not just the Gentiles because, well, the Gentiles didn't have the Ten Commandments. If the Gentiles would have had the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, then they would have been able to be saved. No. Trent is trying to show that not just the Gentiles were totally helpless, but even the Jews who had the Ten Commandments written on stone, even they could not keep the Ten Commandments. Even they were doomed because they were by nature children of wrath and they could not keep the law. So Trent in this chapter on justification is trying to prove that man must admit that we are utterly dependent on somebody else to come and save us. Don't let anybody ever teach you that Catholicism teaches that we can produce our own goodness and that we can just obey the law and work our way into heaven. That's absolutely not true. Now, Trent goes on to say in chapter 2, on the dispensation and mystery of Christ's advent, When it came to pass, that heavenly Father, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, when that blessed fullness of time was come, sent unto men Jesus Christ, his own Son, who had been both before the law and during the time of the law, to many of the Holy Fathers announced and promised that he might both redeem the Jews who were under the law and that the Gentiles who followed not after justice might attain to justice and that all men receive might receive the adoption of sons. Him God hath proposed as a propitiatory through faith in his blood for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also those of the whole world. So Jesus, Trent is showing here, is offered as a propitiatory sacrifice, meaning that Jesus' sacrifice covers all our sins. That Jesus was sent by the Father not only to save the Jews who were under the law, but to save the Gentiles who lived in lawlessness. Jesus came to save those who lived in lawlessness and those who tried to follow the law but could not follow the law because of their fallen nature. This is what Jesus comes to do. And so now we can see that just as Ray Comfort was saying, first you recognize how utterly dependent you are on somebody to help you because of how you have sinned against God. That's true. And Trent says the same thing. And also Ray Comfort's going to show, well, you have to believe that Jesus died for your sins, that Jesus died for you so that you could be covered by his blood, by his sacrifice. Trent is saying to Ray Comfort right there, Amen. That is fantastic. But Trent has more to say. Chapter 3, Who are justified through Christ? But though he died for all, yet do not all receive the benefit of his death. 
but those only unto whom the merit of his passion is communicated. For, as in truth men, if they were not born propagated of the seed of Adam, would not be born unjust, seeing that by that propagation they contract through him. When they are conceived in justice as their own so, if they were not born again in Christ, they never would be justified. Now, right here, what is Trent trying to say? Trent is trying to say, Jesus died for everybody. But that doesn't mean, since Jesus died for everybody, so that everybody could go to heaven, that doesn't mean everybody goes to heaven. Jesus' passion, his life, death, and resurrection, and the merits of that, they must be applied to a person before that person can reap the benefits of what Jesus did on the cross. So even though Jesus died for all, this doesn't mean that all are saved. We first must be justified by Christ, through Christ, through our faith in Christ, entering into a relationship with Christ. Now, where Trent here is starting to differ from Ray Comfort, and where I think Ray Comfort starts to differ from the Bible, is if you notice when Ray Comfort goes and speaks to people, he always proves their sinfulness, their sinful nature, by the acts that they did. And he's viewing it that they need a Savior because they did an act of sin. And while that's true, because we sin, we absolutely need a Savior, you need a Savior because you're born sinful. You are born with the inherited guilt of Adam. Example, look at it like this. When you're born, you are born as a branch of the thorn bush of death that is in Adam. You can only be saved by entering into the vine of life that is Christ. You are not born in Christ. You are not born, you're not born again when you're just born. Okay, it's not that you're born with the life of God until you commit your first sin and then you die. No, you are born under the headship of Adam. So while Ray Comfort tries to prove that we need a Savior because we've sinned, the Catholic Church, like St. Augustine, like St. Paul, who says that we are born as uh, children of wrath by nature, and King David says that he was born guilty, that he was conceived with sin in his mother's womb, the Catholic Church is going to recognize, no, everybody that's born is born under the headship of Adam. So therefore, they need to be born again. They, mean, they need to be killed off from Adam and be born again into Christ. Remember this because we're going to come back to this in our analogy of justification using Pinocchio. That's right. Pinocchio is the key to understanding Catholic justification. And I'm going to prove it to you. So, Trent continues then. So, if they were not born again in Christ, they never would be justified. Seeing that in that new birth, there is bestowed upon them through the merit of his passion. Is bestowed on, on them, they're born again because they worked their way into heaven? No. They're born again, then they receive uh, the grace of being born again. It says, through the merit of his passion, of Christ's passion, the grace whereby they are made just. Remember that, made just. Keep that in the back of your mind. For this benefit, the apostle exhorts us even more, evermore, to give thanks to God the Father. All right, Trent continues here. If they were not born again in Christ they never would be justified, seeing that in that new birth there is bestowed upon them through the merit of his passion, not by us working our way into heaven, not by us saving his, ourselves, but we are justified through being born again, Trent is saying here, by receiving the merits of Jesus' passion, okay? 
And we receive then the grace whereby they are made just. So we are made just through Jesus. Remember that. For this benefit, the apostle exhorts us evermore to give thanks to the Father who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light and hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption and the remission of sins. So notice here. Trent is agreeing with the three statements that Protestants promote and people like Ray Comfort use to show the necessity of being born again. We agree with all of these. One, understand that you're a sinner. It's no different than AA or NA. Any, any uh, program like that will tell you the first step in healing is to admit that you have a problem. Most people do not accept Jesus as their Savior because they don't think they need saved. So by proving that we need a Savior, the Council of Trent's going to say, Amen, good job. Also, by showing that Jesus died for us so that we can be forgiven through His life, death, and resurrection, through His passion, through His merits, and therefore be uh, able to stand in front of God and have no eternal condemnation for our sins, again, Trent's going to say, Amen. And to say that this forgiveness comes through being born again and that it's necessary for a man to be born again Trent's going to again say great job absolutely perfect that's part of the gospel but there are two key aspects here where if we read Trent we're going to see that Trent has two things that it describes in what happens to us in regeneration that many Protestants miss out on one is the necessity of regeneration for everybody that's born. So you are born as a child of sin, therefore you need regeneration. And number two is the idea of how regeneration does not take us back to the state of innocence that we were in or that Adam was in before the fall of man. But regeneration or being born again takes the human to a higher level and a higher position than they ever were even before they committed their first sin. I want to read one last part from Trent and then we'll get to our Pinocchio analogy. In chapter 4 it says, and this is on the, a description is introduced of the justification of the impious or the unholy and of the manner therefore under the law of grace. So, by which words a description of the justification of the impious is indicated as being a translation from that state wherein man is born, a child of the first Adam, to a state of grace and of the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior. In this translation, since the promulgation of the gospel cannot be affected without the laver of regeneration or the desire thereof as it is written unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost okay so what about Pinocchio what the heck does Pinocchio have to do with the Catholic doctrine of regeneration and being born again well I'm glad that you asked first thing let's understand that when Adam was made, Adam was first formed out of the dirt. Adam was made first with a form of a material body. In the same way, Pinocchio was made out of wood. Pinocchio had a moment where he had the form of a boy without actually having any life or movement in him. So we see that with Adam. Adam is brought to life by God breathing into Adam. Now Adam walks around as a man, and there are two trees in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there is the tree of life. The tree of life will unite Adam to God in this very deep, intimate way. Instead, Adam is convinced by 
Satan and Eve to partake in the tree of knowledge and to have that power, which is a pleasure. We see then when Pinocchio, who was not only made out of wood, but Pinocchio is given this life as a wooden boy. Pinocchio can follow his father, but what ends up happening to Pinocchio is instead of being lured by the tree of knowledge, Pinocchio is lured by the island of pleasure. Pinocchio goes to the island of pleasure, and as we can see here, Pinocchio starts engaging in some... He's having a good time, you know, he's drinking beer, he's playing pool, he's smoking uh, cigars. Oh, you know, a little, little, little too much there, too much, slow down, slow down Pinocchio. But what happens to Pinocchio is Pinocchio chooses pleasure over good. And every human being who has not been united with God has done the same exact thing. Now, what we see happening here is Pinocchio is getting the effects of sin. See, sin doesn't just make you guilty, but sin actually affects you. It actually deforms you more and more. The more we engage in sin, the more sin deforms us. To the point, like Pinocchio's buddy here, where you actually turn into a full donkey or a jackass. Okay, that word's in the Bible, so it's not a swear word. Okay, but this is what happens here. So what happens to Pinocchio is Pinocchio is deformed now. He's like a boy, but he has the, uh, he's brought onto himself the guilt of his sin, the effects of his sin, and look at him. Now he's got this donkey thing going on. Now, at this point, we could see Ray Comfort would use all this. He would say to Pinocchio, Do you think you're a good boy? Have you ever smoked a cigar? Have you ever drank beer? Have you ever disobeyed your father? And he's going to show Pinocchio how Pinocchio has sinned. And that's great because Pinocchio has sinned. But now, what, where Ray Comfort would say that Pinocchio needs to be forgiven of his sins, which is true, and that Pinocchio needs to be born again, and in being born again, he is forgiven of his sins. This is the great question. When was Pinocchio born again? When was Pinocchio justified? And we see that Pinocchio, in order to be born again, he first dies, okay? He dies trying to turn back into good, trying... Pinocchio dies, and he dies trying to turn to his father. And when Pinocchio dies, he is then brought to new life. He is forgiven of all of the sins that he did on Pleasure Island. Now, where is it that the Catholic understanding of regeneration parts ways with many Protestants' understanding of regeneration and this is really the fifth point I wanted to make is not only do we differ in the fact that Pinocchio was born wooden he wasn't born a real boy he was born a wooden boy not only do we emphasize that humans are born sinful but when we are actually born again when this instantaneous understanding of we are born again we are justified we are sanctified when this happens and we are forgiven Pinocchio was not justified or born again meaning that the donkey tail fell off and the donkey ears went away and Pinocchio went back to being a regular boy no Pinocchio became a new creation he became a real boy a real son of Geppetto that he never was before Justification is not just the removal of the guilt of your sins and the removal of the punishment of your sins, but it is the renewal of the inner life of the believer. You truly are infused with this life of Christ that is poured out into you. And this is why we agree with St. Paul in 2 Corinthians, where it says that Jesus became sin. God made him 
who knew no sin to become sin, meaning he, he made Jesus who knew no sin to be our sin offering so that we might be declared the righteousness of God? No, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And when you get into some of the Reformation theology, while they, why they think Catholics aren't Christians is because Catholics say that justification is not only the removal of the guilt of our sins, but it's also the renewal of the man becoming a new creation, becoming born again through the love of Christ being poured out into our hearts. And we see with Pinocchio, if this was a ray comfort or a certain type of Protestant understanding of justification. And I don't mean here, there are many Protestants today, ones who are not attached strictly to the Reformation. There are many, I had a long conversation with my former Nazarene pastor uh, last week. And I tell you, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a difference in our view of justification in my conversation with him. And there are many Protestants today, even in the Assemblies of God, and ones that are tied even uh, more to emphasizing the gifts of the Spirit and the Spirit indwelling the human being. There are many who understand that being born again is changing you. It's, it's making you somebody that you weren't before. Pinocchio did not, through his justification and through being born again, Pinocchio did not go back to being a wooden doll. Pinocchio became a real boy. Something was different with him. Does that make sense to you? So if you're a Catholic, understand this. Number one, all children are born like a wooden doll, like Pinocchio. We're all born in Adam. We are all born with the guilt of sin in us. This is why when a Catholic says that you must be born again to go to heaven. We mean everybody must be born again to go to heaven. That includes babies. Babies have to be infused with the righteousness of God. They must have the love of God poured out into them. Unbaptized babies that die, guess what? God can do whatever he wants. And he can infuse that righteousness in them. But we are promised that he will do that to those who are baptized. That's why we baptize our babies. Why don't why is it that some Protestants don't believe you have to baptize babies? Because they believe you're born innocent. They believe you're born without guilt. They believe you're born as a real boy. Only the real boys go to heaven. No wooden dolls in heaven. Only the real boys. And these people think that you're born innocent. You're born just. And therefore, you are not guilty or in need of a Savior until after you commit your first sin. That's not biblical. That is Pelagian. That is a heresy that the Bible uh, is against and Augustine fought against 1,600 years ago. All people need to be born again. So that is one of the five elements of regeneration that we must add to Ray Comfort's understanding. All people need to be born again. No matter how old you are. Because we're all born as the wooden boards of sin. We're all born as a branch in the thorn bush of Adam. And the fifth thing is, the fifth element is that regeneration changes you. It doesn't take you back to the state you were at or the state Adam and Eve were at before they sinned. It takes you to the state Adam and Eve would have been in if they would have taken from the tree of of life. Catholics, like the Bible, like the Council of Trent, absolutely teach that we must be born again. And our belief of regeneration is way stronger than people will think. Know your faith. Know the doctrine. The Council of Trent on Justification isn't that long. Read it. Know it. Preach it. Share it. And understand the miracle that God gave his only son for us. That when we enter into this union with him, he won't just forgive us, but he, he will heal us. Think of Pinocchio when he woke up as a real boy. He's like, this doesn't make sense. I sinned against my father. I went into pleasure. I became a donkey. And now not only am I forgiven, 
but you rewarded me. You rewarded me. It doesn't make sense. The gospel doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why would God do this? Why would he allow us who were born as sinners and engaged in sin? Why, why would he forgive us? Why would he actually make us a walking tabernacle of his son, a walking temple of his son, and the spirit of his son is poured into us and brings us to, to new life, into union with him? Walk in this relationship with Christ. And we've been baptized into Christ and we've received this justification through faith and through our relationship with Jesus. This is what justification, born again, it, it, it was all the same thing. It, this, it, we went from death to life. Walk in it. Because remember, this is the other great question. Once Pinocchio became a real boy, could he go back to the island of pleasure? He probably could. All right, guys, but that's another topic. Don't forget, please, like, subscribe. The comments I've been getting from you guys, are more than I deserve, so encouraging. Thank you, guys. Thank you for partnering with me just by liking and sharing these videos and subscribing. You're helping me to spread the gospel message and to encourage uh, people in the beauty and truth of Jesus Christ in his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You guys are awesome. Thanks.